I'll analyze uh, William Boutique's career, especially in terms of embodiment and the dualistic, discarded enlightenment picture of human nature, a reality that he found troubling and indeed insane. I'll refer to his dissertation and the so-called four canonical thinkers. Uh, Poteet and his graduate students of my era use that term canonical to refer to Kierkegaard, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Wittgenstein, and Polanyi. And I'll conclude with an application to uh, the so-called cognitive science of religion. That part is not in the, the uh, stuff you got ahead of time. In Pascal's, uh, the dissert dissertation on Pascal, uh, but he doesn't directly address issues of embodiment. But uh, of course, he does emphasize the exteriorization of sensibility, where everything's reduced to mathematical abstractions of space and time, where technical reason presumably is controlling a machine like universe. Pascal. Uh, was quoted by Potita at the beginning of chapter one, the eternal silence of these infinite spaces frightens me. Pascal uh, presciently anticipated the culmination of the Cartesian paradigm of mathematical and physical space in relativism and nihilism. The loss of the human self, of course, is strong in Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard is the only canonical course I didn't have the opportunity to take with Potita. Kierkegaard, my knowledge, didn't explicitly deal with embodiment, but of course he, he was all about uh, the centrality of time and decision by the existential self. Uh, Bruce uh, and, and others, I think, uh, talked about how temporality figures very profoundly in Poteet's analysis of our situation, uh, analyzing uh, a melody in particular as emblematic of the temporal nature of existence and his frequent deployment of pretension and retro tension. Temporality also figures prominently in the theme of Greek uh, vision versus Hebrew orality, orality to engage the world. Vision tempts us to imagine that we can cognize reality in a timeless instant. Orality, orality, on the other hand, entails personal engagement and responsibility in a particular place and time. Poteet shared with me and others in a class session Renaissance paintings where everything is crystal clear in the foreground and the background. I was struck then at the pregnancy of his observation, his interpretation, this picture of human nature that conveys a godlike transcendence where all is fully known in, in some immediate uh, sense. This picture continues to haunt deconstructionists and post-structuralists, and Poteet uh, notes that in, in a number of his works. In email exchanges about this conference, I discovered Poteet's intriguing lecture, The Banality of Evil, on the Holocaust. There he analyzes the, the cause, I guess, of the Holocaust in terms, uh, Kierkegaard in terms of lo losing ourselves in the finite, refusing spirit. Um, while I agree with, with Poteet that that's part of the story, I do think that here he, he, he neglected the absolutistic, idealistic side of the modern picture that uh, influenced the Holocaust. It's no coincidence that the Nazis harped upon the alleged disgusting physicalness, the physical bodies of their victims, and that uh, some uh, uh, Nazis participated in the projected glories of the Third Reich as the ultimate consummation of history, a way to overcome death. Merleau-Ponty is the canonical thinker who most explicitly identifies the dualism inherent in the Enlightenment discarnate picture, um, a, a bodiless idealism versus a mindless empiricism, which form two sides of the same Cartesian coin. Engagement with the world. 
quote, potit briefly our mind bodies as imagination and its pretension towards meaning and coherence shapes and articulates the world and ourselves in it. Wittgenstein, of course, focuses on language. He doesn't explicitly dwell on, on embodiment or disembodiment, but he does refer sometimes to the biological under, underpinnings of language, of language games. But uh, it, I think, takes, it took Poti to make uh, that truth very explicit. Uh, my, my favorite quotation is one that Bruce uh, shared uh, this morning, and I won't read the whole thing, but uh, for I claim that language, our first formal system, has the sinews of our bodies, which had them first. At one point, uh, interestingly, Poteet notes that prior to the Enlightenment, reading typically involved moving one's lips. He recognized that uh, with language, the lines between medium and message, between instrument and substance blur. And I see support for Poteet's insight uh, with uh, some neuroscientist, in particular Antonio Damasio, uh, his most popular book, Descartes' Error, some of you may be familiar with. But um, Damasio talks about how all human signs and symbols must involve some connection with bodily sensorimotor or feeling imagery in order to exist in the first place, in order to be comprehensible at all. Wittgenstein uh, very well uh, caught the misuse uh, of language by philosophers captured by the Enlightenment picture. I do talk in, in my paper about, uh, not, not wittingly, but how some of the metaphors that Wittgenstein used could at least easily be interpreted in ways that undermine the, uh, the seriousness of the disease that uh, Poteet uh, was trying to cure language game can denote a lack of seriousness. Form of life doesn't really convey the, the sacredness uh, of everyday life that, that Poteet was getting at and I think expressed. Polanyi, of course, was the only canonical thinker with, with whom uh, Poteet engaged face to face, body to body. For Descartes, knowledge had to be critically evaluated in order to meet the standard entailed by this picture of, of godlike vision and knowledge. Relying acritically upon any presumed knowledge was anathema. The post-critical paradigm reverses the Cartesian paradigm of systematic doubt. It recognizes that there are some things upon which we must primordially, acritically, tacitly, pre-reflectively rely in order to know anything at all. While Polanyi does not often write of embodiment, he does leave no doubt that the inalienable root of all our tacit knowing is precisely our bodies. And, and we can extend our bodies uh, as we indwell um, larger parts uh, of reality. For Poteet, the post-critical paradigm entails our grounding in something prior to and beyond critical, skeptical reflection. Metaphorically employs ground and place to point to that which is primordial. The recovery of meaning of the ground, of common sense of a genuine human self, suggests another Poteetian theme that we are at home in the world, at least if we can be at home in the world if we overcome the insane discarnate picture. This contrasts with the Cartesian world where thinking and extended realities never cohere, a Heideggerian Sartrean world into which we are indifferently thrown, or a Der Derridean Foucaultian world where we can never be present nor mean what we say. I've tipped my hand as far as answering a question posed by Dale. When speaking of an existential recovery of oneself, a return to the ground, 
a post-critical paradigm shift and a recovery of common sense, I claim that Poteet indeed was talking about the same thing. All these began or became ways of speaking about overcoming an insane, dualistic, disembodied picture of humanity in relation to the world. When it comes to, uh, to the prospects of overcoming this insane picture in the academy and beyond, I'm much more pessimistic than I was in my younger days. These days, uh, constructivism still seems to hold a lot of sway in much of the humanities and the social sciences. I found that the AAR's uh, body and religion group is all about how the body is constructed by culture, by the mind, uh, rather than how our bodies, first of all, give us our, our, our reality and, and, first of all, construct reality that we engage with. On the other hand, many natural scientists uh, adhere to the empirical side of the dualism with reductive physicalism. Today, we even have some futurists, uh, now again, really on the idealistic side, like Kurzweil, who foresee a time when human consciousness as information will be uploaded into a great computer, and we shall totally eliminate the human body in our ultimate consummation. And then there's the so-called cognitive science of religion. CSR assumes a reductive phys physicalism as their own ontological stance. Uh, and reductionism for them comes in the form of unconscious mental mechanisms that cause humans to detect supernatural agency when none exists. There's a, a, for them a kind of primacy of person, but we project or imagine persons uh, in nature when they're not there from their perspective. They find uh, some support uh, for their position in the supposed proclivity of children to believe in supernatural agents, uh, saying children are natural teleologists or intuitive theists even. Of course, the fly in their ointment is that young children never really, there's no evidence that young children have ever invented a concept of God on their own. They first get the concept from adults, and then there's these various experiments that, that they're subjected to. CSR also attempts uh, to support the decisiveness of these uh, pre-reflective mechanisms, which for them involve fairly crude anthropomorphizing, by claiming they override more abstract, theologically correct notions. And an experiment uh, for this involves people, adults, reading stories uh, about supernatural agents. And then from my perspective, they ask them really picky questions. And if they don't get them literally correct, you know, then, oh yeah, they, the, uh, you know, their uh, anthropomorphic uh, uh, you know, tendency to detect agents is kicking in here. Um, also, uh, something else they, they neglect because of this focus on personal agency is magic, which uh, I, I would say uh, does. Um, also, th th this uh, focus on, on personal agency causes, for example, one uh, CSR person, Edward Slingerland, to, to basically say, okay, um, the reason why, why even some uh, Western uh, religious naturalists think that, that what we do actually matters, that any of us matter, is because we project uh, our need for social approval onto something, the cosmic screen. My argument against this is that, wait a minute, um, you know, the, the, not only these Western uh, religious naturalists, but most believers uh, of Asian religions uh, they, they do believe in a telos, in directionality, uh, you know, to the, in the ultimate cause or underlying cause of the universe, but hmm, they, they, they don't use personal metaphors. So I think that, that shows a weakness, in, uh, again, in this, this overemphasis over on our supposedly always detecting uh, personal agents that don't exist. While CSR adopts a reductive physicalist stance for itself, it views the rest of us as 
as inveterately dualistic. The dualism it attributes is quite Cartesian and disembodied. In doing so, it in interprets religion in, in a very discarnate way and, and thus reinscribes a discarnate dualism. So for them to make sense of a shaman who uh, uh, imagines flying like an eagle or, or being possessed by the spirit of the mountain, or even just uh, an ordinary person trying to make sense of Freaky Friday, um, they attribute to, to the shaman and the moviegoer that, that they're really Cartesian philosophers who are at some level, level abstractly, logically uh, explaining this in terms of disembodiment. Now, despite this tendency of CSR to claim that we overdetect, uh, or that we, you know, we anthropomorphize, they also claim that we overdetect disembodied gods, goddesses, and spirits. Uh, I think this really contradicts uh, the history of religions in terms of primal and ancient religion, and even ancient Hebrew religion, uh, where God's body is specifically referred to in, uh, in, in parts of the, the Talmud. Cognitive scientists regard belief in life after death as tantamount to a dualistic belief in disembodied spirits. Uh, Jesse Baring is a major thinker. He begins an article this way, quote, by stating that psychological states survive death, one is committing to a radical form of mind-body dualism. He and David Bjorklund uh, had a very interesting and important study where they uh, tell young children a story about a mouse that gets eaten by an alligator. And the whole thing is, you know, what do these uh, children believe uh, about uh, the, the, the conscious states, uh, if, if any, of this, uh, this mouse after it's been eaten and digested by Mr. Crocodile? And, and um, my whole, my main, I, mean, I have a lot of criticisms of it, but uh, my main uh, complaint is that I think I, I suspect that what the, most of the children believed was that the mouse was in a different body in another realm. But none of the questions got at that at all. So, yeah. And um, actually, uh, Paul Bloom, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, he um, you know, just came out with um, a new book on, on evil. He, he wrote Dust Babies a, a number of years ago, but uh, 10 years ago. Uh, at a reunion here, I asked him whether any of these children supported, any of these experiences with children uh, supported the idea that innately we imagine disembodied souls uh, versus mindless bodies over uh, you know, an innate tendency to distinguish between animate, sentient, intentional embodied beings and inanimate things. At that point, he said no. Um, uh, these cognitive scientists have begged the question of uh, afterlife belief uh, entailing dualism. And I, I think also their, their, this, their, their contention flies in the face, again, of evidence from the history of religions where belief uh, in afterlife often has involved embodiment in, in various ways. Well, um, Ted Slingerland shares this official ontology of reductive physicalism. Innate Cartesian dualism ends up playing a peculiar role in his own making sense of life. Uh, and uh, this was an article in JAR, the Journal of the American Academy of Re Religion that I'm re referring to first. He, he begins this article sounding rather Potidian, poking fun at pro-structuralist types who imagine that we just invent our bodily preferences and meanings. And he declares that, quote, the mind is the body and the body is permeated through and through with mind. But then he ends up by concluding that the fundamental nature of consciousness is the same as that of everything else in the universe, a, just a configuration of matter and energy, just more complex than most. Evolution has designed us not to think of ourselves and others as mere things, even though we are. Or as he puts it in the subtitle, we are robots designed not to believe that we are robots. So not to worry, evolution has, since evolution has programmed us to believe our subjectivity and our meanings are real and to act as if they were valuable, what's the problem? What, me worry? Um, of course, for me, and I'm sure all of us, this, this dualistic thinking consigns us to an irreconcilable conflict 
between scientific and metaphysical or ontological truth on the one hand and what makes our life meaningful on the other. The poignancy of this conflict uh, comes out for me in an interview uh, of Ted Slingerlin. He declares, quote, I love intensely, end quote, my six-year-old daughter. But then he confesses that this deep in, uh, affection for his daughter is illogical since he doesn't really believe in love. This is indeed insane dualistic thinking where the embodied love of a parent for one's child is less real, less true than discarnate, alleged scientific truth. What is Poteet's legacy in a world where the insane picture he saw, the insane condition he diagnosed still exists and exert great influence? Uh, Dale Cannon had, had asked uh, in responding to an earlier early draft, who or what has been cured? Well, I, I could say, well, uh, Poteet was cured, and, and many of his students have been, at least partially. <laughs> Unfortunately, currently, there appears to be no identifiable movement within the wider academy to cure the insanity of this picture. Yet because of the insight and the hope that Bill Poteet gave to us, we need to keep that hope and keep that faith. Combating the insanity and helping people find sacred grounding in their bodies in our convivial, natural, and social worlds. Thank you.